So first of all, I also want to say thank you for inviting me to help celebrate John's, um, John's birthday. Um, and let me, let me start by saying I'm a little bit disappointed in the organizers. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit so. No, 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 I'm sorry, guys. You really only see, see him in shades of gray. And, you know, I think of John as being a much more colorful person than, and, you know, between Pat and John, I'm also a little bit worried about you're not giving him many shades of gray. Uh, you know, so I'm a little bit worried, but I see him as a very colorful person and, and having done you know, a lot of really cool stuff. So um, I first met John at the first ICCV in London, uh, so a long time ago. Uh, it was, uh, it's still one of my favorite vision meetings of all time. Uh, it, it was, um, and then I met John again when we sort of did our first meeting about active vision hats. Uh, and then um, quite a few meetings in, in Sweden while I was in Stockholm uh, with Jan Olof Eklund uh, uh, in the sauna and, and other places. And I've written way too many letters for John. I'm sorry, John. Ask for another one, oh, you are? Oh, crap, you know. <laughs> Uh, but I always remember John as the guy that had to show up with the biggest numbers. And it was always, you know, 10 to a gazillion or something like that. And I was like, hey, you know, that's, that's really interesting. But that's actually have, had an impact on me, and, and, and I'll talk about that. Uh, but also, John not only had to have an activation head, he had to have the most complex activation head. Uh, so, so, so that was, uh, so it goes back to, it's very hard to see actually on, on this slide, but, but here is sort of the, the Trish camera head up here, uh, which was, uh, this is from the 1991 paper. Uh, so I was the editor of the special issue, so I had access to the original material. This was before we knew how to take reasonable pictures. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but, but it was very interesting to sort of see, you know, we started doing Activision back then um, and, um, it's almost dead today. Nobody's building Activision heads anymore, which is a little bit sad because now cameras are ubiquitous. You know, they cost nothing and they can be everywhere. Uh, but, but for me, that was sort of, it, it was interesting. We started this and we thought, you know, hardware was the answer to uh, computer vision, which by now I'm convinced that's definitely not the case. Uh, at the same time, I sort of, uh, it, it's interesting that back then, even, you know, Alain Bertos was uh, sort of talking about these are the, the uh, visual regions that are sort of involved in doing gaze control. Uh, and and I'm, I'm still thinking, you know, we need to go back to John and really think about what are all of these different sort of functional sort of specializations that are involved in doing this. Uh, and, and I think the, the overall theme of, of my talk today is that I feel, um, I feel we've given up on actually learning from biology and we're just throwing hardware at it. And, 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 and that really worries me that, you know, I hope we'll see a renaissance where people will actually go back and look at all of the stuff that we've learned from biology and use it to design smart vision systems. You know, we can only get so far by doing brute force. And, and that's what sort of worries me. So, I'm, so I'm, I very much like what John and others have been doing of trying to educate us about what are the ways that we can think about doing functional specialization and through this, figure out how can we actually make this, this tractable, which I feel is, is incredibly important for us to go forward. So, I'm, I start sort of at the other end. I don't start, John is sort of a fundamental, let's do first principles and build this up. I've started the other end, so let's give me some challenging problems and then I'll try and figure out how do I actually build systems for this. So, so some of the trends I'm seeing is that we're seeing this tremendous urbanization, which very much drives the kind of technology that, that we're getting into. Uh, and of course, some of you will say, yeah, that's probably uh, Greece or Athens or, or, or someplace. But even in the US, we're not evenly spread, or even in North America, we're not evenly spread. It's, a, it's an incredibly sparse country, and, and that poses all sorts of challenges for us in terms of building intelligence systems. Uh, because, you know, driving around in this environment, all sorts of logistics, all of this comes into play uh, for us to think about how do we build smart systems. The other thing that's sort of happening is that um, the world is growing older 
Uh, and so, so now we actually need to start thinking about how can we use this to, to figure this out. So, so I don't know what the number is for Canada, but in the US, 10,000 people a day turn 65. So you're one, you're, there's 9,999 other people that turned 65 the same day. And that poses a huge set of challenges for us in terms of how do we, um, and the baby boomers today are predicted to turn 100. Bef you know, and and, and that, the lifespan is expected to be 100. And that poses all sorts of challenges to us in terms of how can we, how can we use the stuff that we're learning about people to make sure that we can have quality of life throughout our entire lifespan and figure out how, how do we, you know, how, how can we, it might not be a problem in Canada because you actually have reasonable health care. But I live in the US right now and this is a huge challenge for us to figure out how do we actually do this in the long term? How do we make sure we can do this? So we've recently started a study where we try to understand what are the needs of people? What are the things that, that we should do to people to figure out how can we actually, you know, what, 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 what assistance do you need in your daily life? Uh, and the good news is through these techniques, we're actually learning. There's all sorts of things we can do to monitor people today. So you might not be aware of this, but through a pair of earbuds, I can extract 70% of a full scalp EEG. And this actually allows me to tell you whether you're getting reasonable sleep, whether you're taking your medication, whether you're relaxed, or you're, all of these things. So this is really cool technology that comes into play. So I think we are at sort of the, the edge of using knowledge like, like what John has done and others to try and understand, understand people well enough that we can support them in the right way uh, throughout this, which, which I think is incredibly exciting. Um, so, so I see very much that we... You know, this was in John's youth. Um, well, I was actually in his middle age, probably. Uh, we, we got to where we had this, and then we've seen sort of tremendous progress on getting ubiquitous sensors, but also getting sort of ubiquitous access to, to data. And it's only now that I really feel we get into a place where we can combine a reasonable amount of data with a fair number of sensors to be able to build really cool technology that can be used for all sorts of applications. Uh, which to me is very exciting. So I, now I'm in San Diego uh, and I work with Qualcomm and Qualcomm's notion is that one megapixels is one dollar and the associated computing power to process this is nine dollars. So for ten dollars you can get the, you can put up another camera then but I can start spray painting the world with cameras because I actually can get someplace if I'm smart about how I do this. So to me that's very exciting. Um, but it's also exciting to me that, that if we look at it, we're sort of going all over the place. So we're starting to, you know, everybody will sort of say, this is not really hard. I'll come back and talk about why I actually still think this is really hard. And then, of course, we get into where we can build sort of play bots like John is interested in. I would love to get one of these robots that could clean up in my house. You know, I go to bed and when I wake up the next morning, everything is pristine and good to go again. Uh, but this is still very hard to do. So, so, you know, how do we get not only to those, but also to these sort of highly unstructured environments? And I'll come back and talk about how um, the world is really very unstructured when we do this. So, there, there, today there are people that say we can sort of recognize a reasonable number of objects. So, you know, trying to challenge Sven and others to talk about a large number. To give you a benchmark, the average grocery store has 46,000 different, ob different objects in it. So if you want to build a robot that can actually go around and pick up stuff on the shelf, you just have to make sure that you can recognize at least 46,000 different objects. And, and so this is a very small case of, of this. So, so the world is incredibly complex. It's really hard to be able to do this. Uh, and one of the things that worries me is, so, so we're, and, and the good news is we're getting these sort of cheap terminals. Um, the other is that we're getting, so we're getting uh, young people that are very experienced users. You might not be aware of this. The average 20 year old male has spent 12,000 hours playing computer games. That's two years with no sleep. <laughs> uh, and, and the good news is that, you know, if you go Tell me how many systems have you seen out in the real world that have been designed to accommodate that audience? 
that audience, you know, this is built into their spinal cord, you know. This is stuff that they can do. They can wake up in the morning and give them a game pad, and it goes off. Of course, I can't use it. I'm too old. And the problem is that most technology that's being designed today is being designed by 40 or 50-year-old men. They're useless because, you know, they don't understand the customer. The customer are people that can do this, or they can do it on a cell phone. You know, so I've been designing technology and robots where I go out and I try to explain it to the kids, and they say, yes, shut up, and give me the game pad. And then they, they operated, you know, zero minutes of training time. So we need to figure out how can we embrace this technology? How can we also embrace this, uh, this complexity that we have to be able to design really smart systems? So I get really worried when people put up slides like these. I won't tell you who I got these slides from, but I'll just say, you know, I get really worried when I sort of say, you know, in the old days, this is what we did. Uh, and then in the new days, this is what we do. Uh, and um, uh, so, so, you know, we've sort of given up on, on trying to do object recognition. In, in the old way, we just, you know, throw a, a, a deep learning network at it and it work just fine. And, and literally, you know, I have students in my graduate class today no matter what problem I throw at them, say, we'll just take a deep learning network and we'll train and we're done. And I'm like, okay, you know, stupidity at its maximum. Uh, so, so it really worries me that, you know, people do this. And, and of course, it comes down to that people have thought about this and say, you know, we'll, we'll take a bunch of images, we'll get it off the internet, and we'll run it, uh, and then we'll feed it into a system like this, and you just minimize over this, it's not that hard. Um, and then they go back and say, this is sort of, you know, back in the day, for ImageNet up until sort of 2014, we were sort of seeing convergence, but it looks like we're sort of getting exponential to 20%, which is not that good. And then people say, you know what, somebody invited deep learning. And, you know, suddenly we get to this, and now I can sort of show that, you know, traditional computer vision is dead. Uh, and that really worries me because, you know, we are seeing this, but, but, uh, and, and, and we are seeing sort of good progress on how we can do this. But I still feel giving up on doing sort of informed architectural decisions rather than just, I'll throw a back box at it and the answer is 34. I, I, that, that's really sort of naive and, and, and it really worries me that we as a field are, are going in this direction. So uh, I, I think there's so much we can, we can learn from, from this and I really want to know, you know, how can we scale this to truly large problems? So I want to go back to sort of John's the complexity problem from 1987. So back in that paper, you know, John was saying, we have sort of, let's say, 10 to the 10 neurons processing, you know, somewhere around a millisecond. Each of them has about a thousand uh, sort of connections. Uh, if we look at sort of a million to somewhere uh, to, to tens or 100 million sort of inputs, uh, and we can sort of say, you know, sort of the famous Israel Rosenfeld, paper, you can tell me any vacation picture, and within 100 milliseconds, I can say, we, we can do this. So back then, it was sort of 100 milliseconds. And to me, that was sort of interesting to say, okay, what does that tell me about the brain? Before I go and sort of talk about John's, I'm sort of saying, I'm a computer scientist, so let me come up with the smartest architecture I can think about for this. Sort of the, the smartest architecture, sort of one with, that's very efficient, would be a hypercube. So if I now think about building a hypercube where I can do sort of 100 instructions per second, that would imply that the brain has somewhere around a terabyte of instructions per second. If I take that and, and I sort of try and figure out what would that architecture look like, then a hypercube, this is a zero dimensional, this is a one dimensional, this is two dimensional, three dimensional, going up, that would imply that the brain is a 35 dimensional hypercomputer. Okay, that might actually not be unreasonable. That would sort of imply that the number of connections in the brain that I've used so far from every cell is 35. That would still imply that I would have somewhere around, you know, so it would imply that the connection between any two cells, uh, if I had to sort of do agreement across the entire brain, would take 185 steps. So in 185 steps, I could get anywhere. Okay, that's a little bit longer, but that would imply that what if the brain was just a hypercomputer? It would also imply that I would have out of 1,000 connections, I would have 965 left that I could use for memory. Great, that would imply that my memory capacity would be free to tens to the 300. Now I'm almost in John's territory of talking about this, uh, so it would be interesting. But the problem is that even if I did this 
I wouldn't be able to. So, so a dumb computer would not be able to do this. So we got, now I get to sort of John's, you know, we have somewhere around 25,000 categories we can recognize as people. Uh, we have, you know, somewhere around 10 to the 7th visual prototypes. If you think about that, we have 12 visual representations, then this is sort of John's, the big number. That would imply that you would have to be able to, if you do sort of exhaustive search, this number of operations. So if I go back, you can sort of say, oops, the wrong way. Uh, if I go back then to my, uh, to my hypercube, I still wouldn't be able to do this. So I have to be smarter than just doing dumb processing. Uh, and, um, and of course, you know, John's conclusion is that we can think about how we do functional specialization and get to a reasonable place. And, and my argument is that we should sort of try and figure out how do we build smart systems that use all of this knowledge we've had from biology to be able to do this, or figure out how do we use models to be able to do sort of informed decisions about building architectures. So, so some of the things that I've been working on is sort of to try and figure out how can I then get access to this, and, and how can I use this to actually build smart vision systems. Um, and the good news is that the, the internet does actually come to my help. So I would like to be able to recognize these sort of 10 million models that, that John has been talking about. Um, I can't quite find that directory yet. I haven't found this directory of all the possible categories out there. But the good news is that I can go to places like TurboSquared, for instance. They have half a million of high-end sort of graphic models that I can actually go and get access to. And even more interesting, I can go to what used to be Google's 3D uh, warehouse, now it's called SketchUp's 3D warehouse, and I can get somewhere around 3 million objects. And I can actually use them to do visual processing. An interesting piece of tidbit here is that anything you can buy in an IKEA store has a 3D model in SketchUp. And initially, when we started looking at this, I was like, yeah, but they're, they're made by hobbyists. They're probably really crappy. They're incredibly good, you know. They're sub-millimeter accuracy. They're really, really good. So clearly, there are a lot of people that have way too much time on their hands during weekends sitting at home making 3D CAD models. Uh, but we win because it sort of allows us to actually go out and be able to use these to build really interesting systems. So, so the way we've been using them is that we've been using them to try and build sort of various kinds of, of, of systems where we can actually do 3D tracking. So I'm very interested in how can I manipulate the world? Uh, so I'm a robotics guy, so I don't want just to do, be able to do vision. I want to be able to interact with it in a reasonable way. So we've, we've sort of set up so we can do some simple way. We'll make the assumption first that we've done some level of recognition. Then we can do basic post estimation. We can use that post estimation with basically an, 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 an edge-based image to be able to do some very efficient tracking. So basically over here, we start doing initialization. Over here, we're doing 3D rendering, and that then allows us to actually go in and do very nice. So the best we can probably do still is that we can track things like a wine glass. If you sort of try to do tracking of this without the model, it's literally impossible. There's way too many distractions in the background and all sorts of things. But if you actually have real models of the world, you can go in and do tracking that you've never, you can see when you do enough occlusion, it will fall off. But the fact that through using models and being smart about how you do it and coming up sort of with the smart architecture, we can do a level of robustness that you can't really do uh, anywhere else. So we've been doing this for um, all sorts of objects, from car doors to books to boxes to you name it. Uh, I think we've done it for... Uh, so here are sort of a couple of examples. One where we sort of do a car door for actually doing sort of real manufacturing. Here is where we use it in, a, um, in, an, auto, in an aerospace setting to be able to go in and actually do inspection. So, so the good news is that by, by using relatively standard models and relatively sort of smart ways of doing architectures, you can do really interesting ways of, of doing this processing. Uh, I'll skip this one. The, but the example is here, we can even do sort of deformable objects models and we can actually track them over time uh, but, but to me, the key is that we try to design sort of an architecture that's a little bit informed about what is the problem we're trying to solve. And by doing this, we can do, today we can do this in somewhere around four milliseconds. Um, so we, we can actually do this very fast. We can do uh, various kinds of real-time processing. 
we can even handle uh, significant outliers. So uh, here's an example. This is from a car factory in Paris. And we have sort of an outlier coming into this, which is basically a person that can walk in front of the model. Uh, and despite this, we can actually do uh, a reasonable level of tracking. Of course, this moves ridiculously slow. Uh, but, um, but the nice thing is that by being smart about how we do this, we can design sort of real systems for, for doing real applications. I already talked about the Boeing thing. Here we can do localization down to a thousandth of an inch. And this allows us to do inspections in ways that you couldn't do before. Uh, I'm not allowed to show you the instrument we're using for measurements, so I'm using a dummy. Uh, but, but it's nice that, that we get into this place, but also that we can, we can do, we can do, today we can actually do very reliable things like bin picking. So this is an example of being able to do this rather than doing stereo, we're using an RGBD camera here. Um, but again, using this, we can go in and pick a variety of different objects uh, that, that we can do, go and do sort of picking off. We're mainly using a variety of different features uh, to do this. Uh, some math behind it, which we don't care about. Uh, and then we can basically build a sort of a way of what would your learning architecture look like and what is sort of what you do on the fly in terms of building an architecture. Uh, we can go in using a graphics board to be able to learn all sorts of features on the fly. So we do lines, boundary points, edges, uh, all of these, and we build them into a hash table so that our representation is not an explicit geometry, but it's basically an underlying hash architecture. So that implies that all of this I can basically learn offline, and that allows me to run this process uh, in, in full real time. So here is, again, an example where we can go in, get the equivalent of a sort of fairly dense field of view. We can, based on this, at least find the objects that have a limited degree of occlusion, pick them up, and, and manipulate them in a reasonable fashion. And this allows us to sort of do noise, occlusion, clutter, but it comes out of the fact that we've been very carefully in terms of how we architect our system to make sure that we can actually do it really well. Uh, so for me, if you're going to do this, you know, in most cases, there are very few cases where you have an industrial process where you're sort of doing camera out the window. What do you see? That doesn't happen in industry, you know. If, if it happens, you should fire the process engineer. You know, so, so, that just, so, so why are we trying to solve problems that don't exist? Uh, so we should make sure that we can actually use these models to make the problem tractable. Um, and not just throw sort of a deep learning network or something of that at it. And, and my argument is that if we design this, so, so for our, like our object tracking network, we basically have a generic architecture, and if you give us a 3D model, we can do tracking. So it's not like, well, for this new type of object, we have to go and retrain it. We don't need to. So be smart about how we built this. So, of course, I'm also interested in sort of related to what John is doing, sort of the playbot, how can I actually put robots into the house uh, for uh, all, sorts of, uh, all sorts of sort of interesting applications? Going into the home is really hard. Uh, so, uh, you know, here is a standard IKEA home. It looks very nice. There are about, a, IKEA sells 100, 120,000, uh, no, 12,000 different objects. And there are 220 different categories on the IBM website. Uh, and that implies in total, IBM has somewhere, or uh, IKEA has somewhere around 100,000 objects that they actually need to manipulate. So if we had to build a vision system for it, this would be really hard. And it gets even harder by, this looks beautiful, right? This is not hard. Well, while I lived in Georgia, we went out, of course, you can blame it on Georgia, but uh, that's not. <laughs> We went out to a number of different homes and deployed robots in their home. Uh, and, and my analogy was I wanted to sort of uh, use the analogy to dating. So we called up families and said, we're going to deploy a robot in your home. It's a Roomba. What do you think? It's like a blind date. And so, okay, they're going to give me a robot. Mm, I don't know. And then we came back, gave them sort of a Roomba, so this would be the equivalent of a first date. Then we came back two weeks later and said, I, are you still using the Roomba, or is it parked in a corner? Uh, we came back after a month to see, did they get to sort of a third date? Came back three months later and said, are you going steady? 
came back six months later and said, are you ready to get married? I know it's sort of a compressed dating scheme. Uh, and um, here is an example from a home. This is the boy's room. This is the girl's room. And, and we were like, okay, this is going to be a little bit of a challenge. Um, and then uh, we came back two weeks later. Uh, the boy had cleaned up his room. The girl was oblivious. And we were like, hmm, okay, this is still... But, you know, the good news is when we came back six months later, both of them had cleaned up their room because then they could use the room. So the take-home story here, of course, is for $199, you might be able to get your kids to clean their rooms. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but it was also very interesting to actually see that, you know, they really embraced this and, and did this uh, because they were very interested in how can we actually leverage this technology. But at the same time, for the robots that we're trying to deploy, it's really hard because the number of objects you encounter in a regular home is, is very difficult. The good news is that we're getting various kinds of, of technologies that, that would, you know, like we have the IKEA catalog, but also we need to be able to track people. The good news is we're getting open face and open, uh, open posts in those systems. That actually allows us to do a reasonable level of monitoring of what people actually do. Um, one of the things we've also been looking at is how can we go in and use sort of the progress we've seen to be able to build models? So, you know, in the computer vision community, we've had, I don't know what the, is the affinity we have to modeling chairs. You know, people have been modeling chairs, and I still remember Kevin Boyer modeling chairs 1988, uh, and we still seem to have some affinity to what, if we can model chairs, we've solved the vision problem. I'm not sure that's true, uh, but, but it's very interesting. So, of course, we also started to this and sort of say, can I find a way of actually going in and building models for this where we can generalize models over time? And it turns out that a lot of the progress we've been able to do on using sort of structure for motion, as it would be called in the vision community, or SLAM, as we would call it in the, in the robotics community, we can actually start to build pretty good models uh, that we can actually use to drive around and navigate this. So we're getting to the place where we can do uh, object-based modeling. So the idea is that as I drive around over time and see objects from different views, there's a way where I can combine those into on-the-fly complement from a generic model to an instance-based model. So if we have the categorical models that John claims we have 25 thousand, uh, that's sort of at a place where we, it might actually be possible to go in and, and do this. So we're seeing how we can go in and use either stereo or, or 3D to build up models aggregated over time, and this allows us to go in and, and recognize objects that we can actually use. And you might not be aware of this, this is actually, so it's coming back to some of the very early stuff. Today, if you buy an LGE vacuum cleaner, an autonomous vacuum cleaner, it will actually recognize your furniture. So it will recognize the coffee table, the chairs, the, the TV, and use this to clean differently according to what are the objects that's in your environment. So the fact that we've made enough progress that we can put it into these really cheap systems. You know, so for a lot of these systems, the bill of materials is 15 bucks. The fact that we can build reliable vision systems into 15 buck systems and and make them do something reliable, like driving around the buildings, is very cool. Uh, but it was because they were very smart about how they do this. The other thing that, so for, for me locally, one of the things that we're doing is that we're building sort of a, let's see if this video plays. Uh, let's see, I might have some sound if we're lucky. Um, my sound might not work here. a tour guide working at the Qualcomm Institute. I enjoy my work. People are kind here, and I love talking to them. By the way, my workmate, Boxbot, is also here. Maybe I should let him talk. Thank you, Bot. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Boxbot. I got my name because my body is made of card boxes. It feels great. Because the card boxes are flexible, the researchers can easily change my design and give me more sensors. What do we do? 
That is a good question. My guardian, we unplug ourselves from the charging dock, and then, we move to a standby position where we can see people coming in. I usually start to introduce myself when I can see a face, but I give up if people have no interest in me. Sometimes I ask the visitor to play trivia with me. The questions are very simple, but I just wanted to talk to people and remember their face using my neural network algorithms. If I see a familiar face, I will greet the person with his or her name, so that I don't play the trivia question with the same person over and over again. I always offer my guests a tour, and I am eager to show all the cool things we have in the building. Did you know that Tristone created a squad of 3D printed selfies to stage tiny protests in public spaces? That is amazing and I love to show the guests about this exhibition. I will be very happy if you can talk to me when you see me, and it is my greatest honor to give you a quick tour. See you next time. So, so it's actually nice. We're starting to get to a point where we can interact with people and, and have a reasonable level of interaction. Our biggest challenge, I would actually say, is not vision. It's natural language dialogue. Uh, you know, even with the sort of introduction of, of Alexa and, and, and other things, trying to do a never-ending dialogue that is not boring after 30 seconds is really hard. Uh, so that's still one of the areas where we are. We are at a level now where we can do recognition of most of the things that we have in the environment. We can do sort of vision to actually track people, take them around. We can do simple things like go and, and pick up things and put them in place. Um, there is a company in, in the US right now that's trying to deploy a robot to assist elderly people um, in their homes for, for simple things like uh, driving around with, with, so if you have a tray of food, you can put it sort of on and say, go to the dining room, and it will go to the dining room. Uh, and systems like that can be sold for somewhere around seven, eight hundred dollars. The fact that you can build sort of robots that are almost as smart as this, and we can deploy them, and they can use place recognition, they can do this, to me is, is, a, is a tremendous level of, of progress for building systems that, that can interact with people I'm still worried about we haven't gotten close enough to, to be able to have the, the never-ending dialogue. So, so my own verdict is that if, if you look at the, the market of sort of social robots that's, that, that's out there today, they've all failed. There, there, there's not a single robot out there that I would actually claim is, is credible. And I measure it in time to boredom. You know, all of these robots, even, you know, the Ibo. You know, I, I see kids stand and look at it for two minutes, maybe, and they say, yeah, I know what it's going to do next, and then they walk away. And to me, that's sort of time to boredom. How can we build intelligent units that can interact with people for more than an hour? That's really, really hard. It requires you to recognize contacts. It requires you to, to be able to, I would love to be able, we're starting to see this, have a robot that can read sort of effect so, so we can do effective computing. I want to know, are they happy? Are they sad? Are they bored? Are they asleep? Uh, which would help me tremendously to be able to drive the dialogue. So if I see somebody that's frustrated and bored, I know what to do with them, and I can learn over time how we do this. So I, so I feel we need to combine dialogue and perception to be able to, to build systems that are much more interesting than what we have today. The system is so bored, you know, I'm like, wow, you know. So, so we haven't learned from the gaming generation. The gaming generation are very good at getting people sort of hooked. You know, I want people to be hooked on robots, not games, you know. Um, so so we, we haven't gotten there. And, and my claim is it's because we failed to combine perception with the intelligence with embodied systems to do this really well. So, so to me, we've gotten far in terms of recognizing human and, and intent. And you know, we have things like open post and open face, they're great, uh, but I still claim you know, none of these robots can actually operate in a reasonable number of houses and do something intelligent. Uh, and robustness is still a major issue. Uh, if we look at it, I hadn't thought about it really until I was on the team that developed the first autonomous vacuum cleaner 22 years ago, before the Roomba. And the guy that I worked with at Electrolux he came up to me and he saw all the stuff that we were doing in the lab and said, yeah, this is really impressive. It's useless. And I was like, what? You know, I have this long a publication list. What do you mean? 
And he, and he said, you are aware if your robot works 99% of the time, that implies that it's broken 15 minutes every day. And I was like, oh, crap, you know. So, so when I was showing him, you know, we had recognition by results of 95%, he said, yeah, that's more than a, an hour down every day, useless. Uh, so it's just hard, you know, in the real world, this is really hard. How do we get to 99.999? Just to give you a sense, in the aerospace industry, you are allowed one failure every seven years. You know, that's sort of, that, that's the error metric. If, if you want to compete in that space, and, and I'll be talking a little bit about autonomous driving cars, the average time between fatal accidents for humans is 100 million miles. Humans drive 100 million miles between every fatal accident. We're not close, you know, by, by a long set. So people typically show this when they talk about self-driving cars. What's wrong with this picture? Person. Sorry? There's a person in there. Okay. No other cars. Exactly. There's no traffic. You know, self-driving cars with no other traffic. I can do that. Uh, you know, come to California and I'll show you. It looks a little bit different. It. Well, the good news is if you're in California, if you're in San Diego, it is sunny like this. I used to live in Stockholm. Five days a year, it looks like this. You know, so, so we have to be able to, how can we do this when it's snowy, when, when there's lots of traffic? Uh, almost all the cars that we're developing today are for the highway. We've sort of gone in, in the opposite direction because, you know, so, well, so the good news is we're getting these, and I don't know if you've seen the, the, this YouTube video, it sort of gives you... These people are, be, are supposed to be able to take over control of the vehicle within 12 seconds. And this is not the only video that's out there of people sleeping on the way to work. Just to tell you, people trust technology. So, so there are thousands of videos out there of people that go on 101 and go to sleep and make the assumption that the car will actually take them to work. This is scary because, you know, you're supposed to be able, right now, you're supposed to be able to take over within 12 seconds. And, and the very few people that can get contextual awareness, take control of the car, and do something intelligent in 10 seconds. So this is, this is a huge problem that we have, that technology, people say, oh yeah, autonomous driving cars, let's, good, let's do it. Um, of course, I was still claim, you know, not too long ago I went to, um, I drove over um, the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, and there's a Google car next to me. And on the other side was a 20th year young lady. She was on the phone trying to put up makeup and driving at the same time. I was more worried about her than I was about the autonomous driving car. Uh, so, you know, so we do have this out there, but it's a huge challenge for us to figure out how do we build these systems and how do we do this uh, in such a way that we can actually build a reasonable level of situational awareness uh, and do this in areas where you might have traffic and you might have this. So, I don't know if you saw this week there was sort of an, an, an article that said that a company is starting to do self-driving cars in Texas. Um, and this was the picture they showed of the vehicle. This tells me that we are pre-paradigmatic. It seems like whenever there's a problem, you slap a sensor on the, on the robot and eventually you have enough sensors to get to 99%. Uh, I don't want to be driving in vehicles that looks like, you know, um, that, that looks like early days in mobile robotics. We kept adding a new sensor to a mobile robot until we didn't run into things. Uh, and, and so this is scary. We're starting to put these on our roads. We're starting to really figure out, you know, where are we in terms of, of, of doing this? 
So, um, of course, my argument is most of the companies that are doing this, like here, have two LIDARs on there. As a vision person, I have to say that um, I feel LIDARs is cheating. You know, that, that, you know, if, if people can do it, why can't we do it? Why do we have to use LIDAR? It should be possible uh, to do this. And, and we are actually making tremendous progress on, on this. So I want to get to where can we do vision only? Um, and, and, and one of my, my questions is that today people are using these maps that are incredibly dense. So if I go back to, to sort of this, people are using sort of centimeter level maps. If you've driven around even on campus today, you will realize that the map changes. It's probably valid for the next five minutes. So building maps that are sort of accurate to centimeter level and making the assumption that I can come back later and do this is sort of fairly useless. Uh, so I live in a relatively new neighborhood in San Diego. A year later, whenever I drive into my neighborhood, the car will say, you are going off road. And I'm like, no, you know, there is a real road here. So, uh, you know, uh, so, uh, so, so we need to figure out how can we go back to building systems that have this and, and I think w people are being sort of overly optimistic about this. So um, a company uh, that, that we've talked to claim that they will get to level four autonomy this year. So, so the National Highway Transportation Safety Agency have five levels of autonomy. So level one is sort of basic sort of warning. Level two is automatic parking. Uh, level three is sort of what you're seeing from Tesla where you're starting to see some level of autonomous driving. Level four, the expectation is that the driver will never take control of the vehicle. There is still a steering wheel if you want to intervene, but the expectation is that you never do it. Level five is sort of Waymo. There is no steering wheel. Companies are now starting to claim that this year they can do level four autonomy. Um, anybody who's done perception for more than a graduate course will know that perception is, and doing it reliably is really hard. So, so, I, so I think we're still in for, for something about this. So we, we are actually building a system uh, at the UCSD to try and go after this. Uh, and and we're, our argument is that most of the people that do autonomous driving today do it on the highway. That's relatively easy on the highway. There's only one-way traffic most of the time. Uh, and uh, you don't have to worry about sort of crossing traffic and all of this. Uh, on the UCSD campus, we have 65,000 people every day on campus. So it's like a small city. Uh, we have um, 35,000 students. We have 30,000 faculty and staff. Um, we have a lot of these zombies on campus that sort of, you know, are sort of perceptually blind. Uh, going around, and we have to be able to, you know, the first time I run into a student, Padip will fire me. I know he will, so, you know, so I, I don't have that option. I have to be sort of 100% perfect. So the question is, how do we build systems in this environment where I have bicyclists, skateboarders, all of this? One of the interesting things there is also to try and understand how do we do vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication? So many of you will make the assumption that when you drive around, that you were spending time looking at your fellow people, and, and so you're gonna look at the gaze and say, am I going first, are you going first? We wanted to test that hypothesis. We don't have an autonomous driving car yet, so how do you test this? You dress up a student as a car seat. So we have students that when they sit in this, it'll look like a car seat, they're dressed up and they're looking out through sort of a mesh, so you can't tell that there's actually a person in this, and we drive around, and we haven't seen any change in behavior, whether there's a person in there or somebody who's actually sitting in this. We try and tell the drivers that you have to follow the letter to the, sort of the, the, the law to the letter, so that you can actually see interaction between this. That frustrates people, because nobody follows, you know, nobody drives with the letter, to, 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 to the letter, you know, so you always creep into traffic, and, and, and you sort of, You'll, if you actually drove according to this, people will start honking their horn and saying, what's wrong with this stupid idiot? Uh, but that's, so that's one of the, the big challenges we have is to figure out how do we actually do this well. The other thing we've been working on, we do actually have a LIDAR on our robot, but I'm trying to get rid of it as soon as possible. 
but, but one of the things that, that, that we're very interested in is um, how can I predict short-term traffic? How can we use this to, uh, to do this uh, where, where we can predict uh, behavior over time? You can't build a car and drive reactively. People are incredibly good at doing anticipation and doing this. So the question is, what can we do to do this? The motivation for this actually didn't come from doing autonomous driving. There is a company in, in San Diego, uh, Lytx. Lytx uh, has uh, built a camera system, has 16 cameras. 12 of them are outside the car, uh, sorry, eight of them are outside the car looking at up to 16 different objects that's being tracked. So you basically do traffic modeling. And then they have uh, eight uh, cameras inside the cabin that's tracking the driver to try and understand, are you texting? Are you sleeping? Are you, all of these things you're not supposed to do. Uh, and, and what it does is that if you do this, it will warn you and say, we think you're texting right now. You need to stop doing this. Uh, and if you don't, what will they do? They will record a video segment and send it to HR. So when you come in for your quarterly review, it will say there's these five videos we need to talk about here. You were speeding, you were sleeping, you were texting, you were... Um, this is now installed in all UPS, DHL, FedEx trucks. So in the more than 180,000 trucks. And they drive a billion miles a week. Uh, they see 4,000 accidents every day. Uh, their motivation is that when you do this, the insurance premium goes, goes down tremendously. Because first of all, people actually drive better when they know if you do something stupid, HR will call you up and say, you are aware we have a few of these that we need to talk about. But the other thing is that if you go to court and you show up you know, and said, well, I'm from UPS, I have five minutes of video here we should look at, most people will say, let's settle out of court. Uh, so whether it's their fault or not their fault, this is a way, but the good news is that we are using these, these, this material now to figure out how can we, based on 4,000 accidents a day, predict what we will tell. So we actually have a system that will predict up to, that will predict traffic and, get, and tell you where all of the, the different things are. And by using sort of even a model up to about, right now we can predict up to two seconds into the future. Um, and we can use this to predict, and, and so we can basically tell them, said, you are aware that bicyclist is not going to stop at the intersection. You better brake or you better speed up so that you can do this. Uh, we haven't gotten to five seconds yet, which is really where we want to get to. Uh, but in most cases, we have very strong models. We can use these very strong models to be able to go in and say what's happening. Our biggest challenge is that we haven't figured out how to tell the driver. Because now I can see all of these cars driving around in the environment. And, and you know, if I put it on the head-up display in the car, the driver would stop looking at traffic and be confused by all of these things happening on the front screen. So we haven't figured out yet what do we do. Right now, the best hypothesis we have is that we can put tactile sensing into the seat of the car. So you're going to get butt feedback. And that will basically tell you where the driver is. Because we haven't figured out, you know, if you put it on the screen, it's going to be ridiculous, you know. So how do we actually communicate this to the driver in such a way that he understands what's going on? And our best hypothesis, unfortunately, is butt feedback. Uh, so, um, so for autonomous cars, I think this is a very interesting challenge to figure out where are we in terms of opening up for sort of interesting opportunities to be able to do this. It's an area where we can use very strong models. Uh, there are letters of the law. There are traffic patterns that we can use for this. Uh, the hard part is that we still can't handle pedestrians and bicyclists because they actually don't follow the law most of the time. Uh, so that's one of our big challenges uh, to figure out how we do this. So, so this is still very much sort of ongoing work. But my argument is that driving on the highway, that's the easy part. Driving on campus in these places is still really hard. So there's some really cool opportunities out there. Uh, so I wanted to wrap up and uh, say, and I, I think... There's lots of cases where we can actually structure our design so that we can optimize the task. Uh, and, and general purpose vision is still too far away. But, but one of the things I would sort of say uh, a little bit is that I feel we have a disconnect between the people that build artifacts and the, the biological sort of vision community in terms of we're not being informed enough about how should we build smart systems. So we're still doing sort of 
brute force systems rather than learning from the lessons. We have very detailed architectures. We have a lot of knowledge. So when people put up and said, well, I'm going to put up this 16-layer neural network with 300 nodes in each of them and just do brute force, that will not generalize very far. So I feel we need to figure out how do we do a marriage where we actually use all of this knowledge from, uh, from biology and from nature to build systems that are, that are much better than what we can do so far. So I still think um, there's some really cool hard problems out there. If I sort of look at my John Satsas lessons, then, you know, I, I think what John has done to sort of try and map out and how do we do and where, where can we use attention, we will never have enough computing power. Even though, you know, I'm in the city of Qualcomm, uh, they would love to sell you 500 chips to put into your robot. That's not the solution. We need to be smarter rather than brute force. Uh, so, and, but I really think that we haven't managed to communicate this well enough to the community. So I still think we have work in front of us to be able to figure out how we do this well. Uh, and with that, I'll stop and just say, John, I think you're more colorful than your organizing committee gives you credit for. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>